Fine. Here we go. So you have 30 minutes or something. Let me know if you want me to warn you at some point. Oh, yes, warn me, please. Okay. Please. Do the chairman. <laughs> okay, so yeah, thanks for the invitation to, to, to present this, uh, this thought um, about uh, the links between uh, object-based versus relation-based ontologies uh, that we have started to, to have together uh, since actually you invited uh, uh, Carlo Rovelli at, uh, at your uh, journal club uh, last year. And um, so that was, that was very inspiring. And, and this is what uh, uh, some sort of synthesis I'm going to present today. Um, so as you noticed, I changed a little bit the title. Uh, my title originally was extremely general. But actually, I, I restricted this uh, basically to the, to the quantum world. And uh, if you play the game of opposing object-based versus relation-based ontologies in the quantum world, very quickly you find relational quantum mechanics on the one hand and contextual objectivity on the other hand, which is way less uh, well known, but uh, I'm going to try to, to give you uh, guys an, an introduction to this if you are not aware of uh, what uh, Philippe Grangier, Naila Farouki and myself have been uh, have been telling about for um, a few years now, almost 10. <laughs> voilà, last thing on this first slide. Uh, I'm not a philosopher, I'm a physicist. And uh, therefore, I'm, I'm going to play the game of, of adopting uh, always a very naive point of view on, and, and also trying to get some reflexivity about what we as scientists and philosophers are saying and what could be the societal and also ethical implications of what we say and where we should be careful. And I'm going to put red flags uh, sometimes. Uh, that's the role I take uh, here today. So um, I don't have any iconography from Descartes. Actually, it's, it's much more to the ground. I'm going to put pictures of my favorite movies. And one of my favorite movies is The Matrix. So this is my first slide, actually, the, the fact that at the beginning, when we are babies and children, we are all like Mr. Anderson, uh, who is one of the, the characters of the Matrix. And basically, we live in a world uh, made of objects with properties, and don't, we don't question this too much until we find a wise guy named Morpheus, who uh, tells us a choice, gives us a choice, taking a blue pill or a red pill, and we take the blue pill, and then we wake up. And actually, we discover that uh, the world is not that simple. And all the impressions that we have, the intuitions that we have on the fact that the world is made of objects can actually be an illusion. And that we could get simply impressions that are uh, plucked in our brains by machines. Um, so hopefully, hopefully, we don't live in the matrix. Uh, and we don't live in Plato's cave, which actually the matrix is some sort of modern version of. But the fact is, uh, we can never prove that what we say exists, exists. Uh, ontology is always a bet. It's always postulated. And this um, gives, me the gives you the flavor of what my talk is going to be about. Ontology should be taken as a free, rational choice. It is always postulated, it can be seen, and here I'm going to use physics, phys physicist words, it is a model to account for our perception with respect to criteria that we uh, choose freely. And these criteria can be extremely uh, various. That can be, for instance, the efficiency, the memory size of a machine that would be programmed using this ontology that we are using. That can be also and this is an important concept I'm going to insist on in the talk, uh, with respect to a regulating ideal. What is the image of the world this choice of ontology brings on the table? And so in this talk, I'm going to, to, to use this mindset, and I'm going to examine the pros and cons of two big classes of ontologies, ontologies that are object-based, uh, OBOs, and ontologies that are relation-based, RBOs, in the mundane life and obviously in quantum physics. And since I am a quantum physicist, 
I'm going to talk mostly about the implications for quantum physics. And therefore, uh, instead of talking about relation-based ontologies in general, I will mostly focus on relational quantum mechanics, which is good because this is the topic of, of today's workshop. So I think I'm in the scope in there. Um, and once this um, fair assessment of the pros and cons is done, uh, I'll finally present and propose contextual objectivity as another possible ontological choice that um, provides solution to the cons that we will find both in RBOs and in OBOs. So that's the program. So first of all, object-based ontologies. So the tenet of object-based ontologies in general, it's, it's basically a, a realist tenet. There is a world out there. This world is made of objects that carry properties. And here is uh, a dialogue, which is not really in the matrix, but that could be in the matrix. Neo um, uh, is interrogated by uh, Morpheus. And Morpheus asks Neo, what, what really makes you think that that pill exists and that this pill is blue? And actually here we can all, as a virtual group, we can all make the, the experience. Uh, we, we are all holding computers. What makes us think that this computer exists? Well, we can close the eyes, open the eyes, close the eye, open the eyes, and we keep seeing the computer. So, and we keep seeing the computer with specific properties. And for Neo, it's the same. He opens the eyes, closes the eyes, he keeps seeing the pill, and he keeps seeing it blue. So there is a repetition in the sensation. And Neo can also uh, ask Trinity, who is around, if she sees the blue pill too, and she agrees. So this um, feeling of certainty, it's based on agreement between perception and repetitions between perceptions. So now, what's the point? This repetition in sensations and the agreement between perceiving agents you can tentatively explain this pattern by postulating a fact. And this fact goes beyond our perceptions. The pill exists and it is blue. And doing so, we are way less naive than uh, Mr. Anderson. We, we don't naively believe that the objects exist and that they have properties. We adopt something like an hypothetical deductive strategy. We make the assumption that the pill exists that it is blue until proven wrong. So we are very near proper falsifiability here. It is not a naive way of, of operating here. We choose an objective ontology. Okay, so, and why is, what is the point? So what do we mean by the fact the pill exists and it is blue? First thing, which uh, you all know, well, it means that there is an objective reality. There is an object, the pill, that carries a property, it is blue, it is not red, and this is independent on any, of any perceiving agent. That's usually what we think when we think about objective reality. But actually there is more, which is much, much more interesting from a practical point of view. It also means that I can bring any other character from any other movie, movie which is not in the Matrix, for instance, Fräulein Maria from The Sound of Music, and she will see that the pill exists and that the pill is blue as well. So what do I mean by this? I mean that facts, they can be checked, they can be verified, they can be falsified. And by default, our fact, it means that any other agent will see the same blue pill. So objective reality as captured by facts, it makes perceiving agents live in the same world. And this is extremely important for society. So what are the pros of object-based ontologies? They make objective reality the legal ground of facts that are available to agents' verifications. And objective reality and the facts it supports, they allow for trust. And trust, it allows for action, it allows for living in society, and it uh, allows for science. So this is uh, almost a political message here 
facts in the old, and I'm not saying old fashioned, but in the old sense, they matter. Uh, in the, in the uh, 70s, facts were, were valued at a point where with a fact, you could uh, break down a president. Nowadays, we have people who believe in flat earth and facts are way less valued. So as scientists and as philosophers, we really need to pay attention to the terminology that we are doing. This is, <laughs> please, <laughs> voila. So that was, I'm closing the parenthesis, I mean, but that's an important one. So um, I keep with the pros of objects-based ontologies. We have one single cause for many identical perception, thanks to this notion of object that garries properties. So basically, we can eliminate all the redundancies and we get an efficient description of the world. And if we were in the machine learning mindset, I'm just throwing the idea here. I have not verified this, but if we were doing machine learning, maybe a machine that would use this object-based ontology would require less memory than another machine that would have to retain all the possible perception to choose a course of action. So that's, that's also an ingredient uh, that I believe can be important in the choice of ontology that we make. Okay, so now here comes the cons of objects-based ontologies. As you saw, establishing facts and postulating the existence of objects with properties, it's based on repetition, it's based on agreement between agents, and at the end of the day, it's based on some sort of certainty as the character of a confirmed fact. And we all know that quantum physics is probabilistic. So we feel like uh, getting rid of objects-based ontologies because of that. And uh, I'm going to precise this point immediately, but first an intermediate slide to tell you how we switch from an ontology in the mundane life to an ontology of physics. So this is essentially a change of terminology, but the mindset is the same. Objects become systems, experience becomes an experiment, perceptions become measurement or answers to question. And um, in this kind of restricted perimeter of a physics experiment, we are going to propose ontologies based on the phenomenology of, a, of the physics experiment. So that could be qualified as a lab ontology. But obviously, our goal uh, is to go beyond the lab ontology and to go to a universal ontology that will describe the world independently of the physics experiment. So I will pay attention when it comes to especially contextual objectivity to tell you how we operate this switch and we, we really talk about an, an universal ontology. Okay, so what is the quantum problem? Um, well, here we all know the problem. <clears throat> we have a so, and I'm not going to, to show iconography from uh, physics experiments. I'm going to stick to my blue pill and my red pill and my matrix characters, because it's important to have like a consistent, uh, consistent iconography here. So in our physics experiment, what happens? The system that we are considering is the pill. And we are uh, measuring the color of the pill. So Neo is basically asking the pill if it is blue or red. Say he finds blue. Then there is Fräulein Maria that is arriving and it asks another kind of question to the pill. It asks if the pill is hard or soft. She finds soft, fair enough. But then what happens with the quantum phenomenology is if we send Morpheus and Morpheus asks again if the pill is blue or red, then there is a chance that he finds red and not blue anymore. So in the quantum phenomenology, the full repeatability of the measurement outcomes seems to be lost. So how do we solve the problem? Well, Einstein would have said, just get rid of quantum mechanics. <laughs> and uh, the fact is that history, and especially Alain Spey and John Bell, have shown that, well, we have to deal with quantum mechanics. So, we just have this problem that we face that it's difficult to attribute absolute properties to objects. And one solution to get rid of this conundrum is to go to relational quantum mechanics. So from what I understood from relational quantum mechanics, objects have no absolute properties 
and for RQM, properties they derive from relation between objects, which is something that we could also have extracted from the dialogue between Morpheus and Neo. Because when we talk about repetition and when we talk about agreement between perceptions, we actually talk about something that in physics we call correlation. The repetition, it's a temporal correlation between Neo's perception. If Neo first sees the peel blue, then he always will see the peel as blue. And uh, the agreement between agents, it's a correlation between agents' perception. So if Neo first sees the peel as blue or red, then he and Maria always will see the peel as blue or red. So this repetition and um, agreement qualify as what we call correlation. So now, what is the reasoning? Properties, as we saw from uh, Morpheus Neo dialogue, they require to be established repetition and agreement. Repetition and agreement, they are correlations between events. Correlation, they actually mathematically capture relations between events. So the logical consequence of all that is that properties, they derive from relation. And objects, they have no absolute properties at all. So this is what I understood from the tenet of uh, relational approaches. And um, so just to, to, to make uh, sure that I get the point, in this view, reality becomes a collection of equivalent systems that interact with each other, influence each other, and get correlated. And the properties, they are nothing but the instantiation of this correlation, and they show up because there are some relation or interaction between systems. So at this point, I've just been uh, objectively presented this, and now I'm entering into the pros and cons uh, game. What are the pros? In this view, measurement and also perception, this is a correlation. So we have two equivalent systems, like the peel and the camera, or even the peel and neo, and they get correlated somehow. They share information on each other. They measure each other. And the good thing is that we don't need any perceiving agent to understand what a measurement is and to have properties that show up. This is actually extremely objective in that, uh, in that uh, perspective. And um, what is nice as well is that physics, it allows us to describe the buildup of these correlations. So it allows us to basically monitor this autonomous appearance of properties, which is also something really cool. But then what are the cons? So there are two types of cons, in my opinion. And here I'm starting to get my opinion back on the table. Um, it's about the regulating idea. So which kind of world do we talk when we see it with the RQM glasses? So the first thing to realize is that if there are no probabilities, there are no correlations. For a very simple mathematical argument, correlations, they are quantified by what we call mutual information which can be written in that way, where S is the entropy of the system. And, as you re and this entropy of the system, which measures the mess or the ignorance on the system, um, it simply goes back to zero if, uh, if events are certain. So in a certain world, with certain events, there are no correlations anymore. There are no information anymore. So what's the consequence of that? If there are no probabilities, just certainty, then there are no correlations. As a consequence, there are no properties. And in the end of the day, there is no ontology. So in my view, but this will be to discuss with Carlo later on, um, I have the feeling that uh, RQM proposes an ontology for the world that is probabilistic by essence. And certainty, which is the character of a confirmed event, plays no special role in the buildup of the ontology. It's just a special kind of probability. And my question in there is, practically speaking, what is the purpose of our action in this probabilistic world? Is that just about bets 
is that just about using Born's rule as the sole map and compass, just like in cubism? So, um, uh, what is the ethical consequence of leaving certainty aside? That's uh, a first uh, class of question I would like to ask. Um, the second and uh, much bigger con I have, but uh, Carlo knows about this, we have discussed that many times, it's uh, the fact that if properties show up within a relation between objects, then the same happens for facts that capture the properties. And the consequence is that uh, the peel is blue is a fact for the camera, the camera's memories is blue is the fact for a peel, so facts are relative. The critical situation being the one that is pinpointed in, in Wigner's friend's experiment, where facts even contradict uh, each other. So these facts are relative. Uh, here I put my red flag again. This sounds very good to relationalists, because we think in terms of this is similar to relativity, this does not imply relativism, and there are absolute facts as well. So in the end of the day, it's not that serious, the problem. But for the ears of an objectivist, it sounds very wrong because relative facts, they sound like alternative facts, fake news, and words matter again. So, and an even worse argument for that is that even Einstein relativity, it needs real facts to be established. So by claiming that facts are relative, uh, both scientists and philosophers, we are shooting ourselves in the foot. And uh, I would say that the word fact needs to be preserved, protected, this is precious. So here comes CSM, and uh, I don't know how much time I have left, uh, uh, Chairman. About um, about eight minutes, I was counting. Eight minutes, good. <laughs> so this is actually a third option that I want to, to present you, and I hope it will also feed the discussion later. So CSM is uh, the acronym for Systems, Context, and Modalities. And uh, the ambition of, of this uh, uh, proposition of ontology for quantum mechanics is that it, it basically grasps the best of object-based and relation-based ontology. Why? Because with CSM, you will find objective facts and objective properties, just like in objects-based ontologies. But we are not as naive as Mr. Anderson, and properties, they will show up in a system context relation, just like in relational quantum mechanics. So how does it work? What's the magic? I'm going to start again with the same dialogue, between, that's the, the starting point for the different ontological options. So to uh, build an ontology, again, there is this idea of repetition and agreement between perceptions. And actually, this repetition and disagreement, before I said this can be seen as a correlation, but there is also a dimension of certainty. Um, once Neo has seen the blue pill, he will always see the blue pill, and that will be confirmed by Trinity, by Maria, by uh, any other character you want. So there is a certainty that is conditioned to the first perception. And then this uh, first perception that is confirmed can be upgraded as a fact. And this fact is supported by some external objective reality, that is the path of thoughts that usually we unconsciously follow. So now, what happens when we are in the, in the quantum phenomenology? So in the quantum phenomenology, as we saw, it seems that if we change question, we don't get the same answer, so we lose the repetition argument, we lose the agreement between agents, and it seems that it discards objects as relevant ontological concepts to capture what happens in quantum mechanics. Our diagnosis with CSM is that we can perfectly keep objects carrying properties and verifiable facts that they can be, be made consistent with quantum physics. And the way we, we proceed, the strategy, is to follow the certainty, not the white rabbit, but the, but the certainty. How do we preserve repeatable events that can be confirmed by several agents in quantum mechanics? 
It's simply by keeping asking the same question, meaning you don't change the surrounding experimental context. So as an example, to preserve repeatability and agreement, Neo and Morpheus, they should not change the measuring apparatus surrounding the pill. And facts, they are induced from repeatable events confirmed by several agents. And the only way to preserve this repeatability, again, is to keep the same context. Therefore, facts are about systems and their surrounding concept, context. And I'm going further. Properties, they are induced from fact. So therefore, just like facts, properties are carried by system and their surrounding context. And we call modalities such system context properties. And in the example of matrix, uh, blue is the property of the pill and the surrounding measuring device. And within a given context, modalities, they are exclusive, like in the everyday life that we know. They are blue or red, they are hard or soft, and any other kind of question you can ask. So now the problem is, uh, are we talking about a lab ontology or something more general? So in the example that I took, which is a, an extrapolation from what happens in a quantum lab, the context surrounding the system, it encompasses a measuring apparatus. And so are we just building a lab ontology, which is kind of boring and which is usually the, the, the drawback of Copenhagen uh, interpretation of quantum mechanics? And the answer is no, we are not building a lab ontology because context, they are not necessarily measuring devices. And I'm going to go even further. Context, they are universal. We have context in, in right now in the world that we live in. Even in mundane life, we never see a system directly. Actually, the event, they can only become repeatable and confirmed by several agents through a context, which is everything around the system can be a measuring device, but can also be the molecules of oxygen, azote, and whatever you want that is uh, between you and the object that you are looking at, that support the perception of multiple agents. So to give you a definition of the context, actually the context, it is the place where objective facts show up. It is even their condition of possibility. That sentence, it's defining the context. And contextuality is universal. So we are not, with CSM, attached to a quantum lab. Uh, so to compare now CSM and RQM. So both in CSM and RQM, properties they derive from a relation between equivalent systems for RQM, facts and properties, on the other hand, are relative. And for CSM, uh, between the system and the context. And the system and the context, they are not equivalent. And because of the fact that the system and the context are not equivalent, in CSM, facts and properties, they are objective because they are manifested in the context and the context gives rise to objective facts. I'm repeating a bit the idea because it's a bit uh, abstract. <laughs> In CSM, modalities are contextual and they are objective because they show up in a context where facts and, mod and properties are objective. So there is no need for any perceiving agent to measure the measurement outcome. It exists even if unobserved. Any incoming agent who is perceived blue, for instance, and the agreement between agents, it is guaranteed by construction. So there is no wigner friends paradox uh, in the CSM approach. And to conclude, I'm going back to the initial question. So I mentioned at the beginning of the talk that an ontology can be chosen using rational arguments. And in the light of quantum phenomenology, I asked the question, should we rather choose uh, object-based or relation-based ontologies. In object-based ontologies, the pros is that we have verifiable facts, trust and certainty, uh, that are supported by objective reality. But the point of concern is the consistency with quantum mechanics. On the other hand, with relation-based ontologies, 
we have properties that are relation between equivalent system. Physics is the study of these correlations, but the point of concern is that our facts are relative and world is essentially, the ontology of the world is, is built on probability. And CSM somehow solves uh, both points of concern. Um, first of all, because it is based on objects carrying properties and therefore it preserves the fact, the old uh, acception of facts. Um, it is an object-based ontology, but objects are bipartite because they are made of a system and the context. And this is consistent with quantum phenomenology. On the other hand, properties characterize the system context relation, but the system and the context are not equivalent. By definition, the context supports objective, verifiable facts. Uh, one important point, which will all, uh, all, almost be my conclusion, in CSM, measurement is not a correlation between equivalent systems. It is the revelation of a verifiable fact inside a concept, context, sorry. And this fact is stable in time. It can be verified by as many agents as needed. And I conclude on the regulating ideal. So in CSM ontology, it is built, it is chosen with respect to what can bring certainty, trust, and on-demand verifiability. And contextuality somehow defines these islands of stability. And on the other hand, randomness and probabilities, they are a consequence of contextuality, which is the first postulate I presented you, and also quantization, which I did not present because I had no time, but uh, I can tell you more if you want. And therefore, the CSM regulating ideal, it's, it's such that certainty comes first and randomness comes second, which is a very different mindset than uh, usual, uh, well, especially relation, uh, relational quantum mechanics, I believe. And that was my last slide. I thank you for your attention. And uh, there is a talk on the same topic I give in one week in the New Directions of Foundations of Physics for, for those who want to know more. Voila. Thank you, Alexia. Okay, so we have uh, 15 minutes. Uh, we're a bit late uh, and we have a lot of questions. So. First one on the list is Daniele Oriti. Yeah, hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, I'm trying to understand a little bit better, but, but I'm a little bit confused. It seems to me that uh, you're calling a context uh, what in relation to quantum mechanics uh, call an observer, uh, which is fully objectified, is, uh, is doesn't have to be an agent uh, and, uh, and so on. So, what you call objective context dependent fact uh, is what in relational quantum mechanics they call a relative fact. And there's no issue also in relational quantum mechanics that uh, different observers, if the only way they interact with the system is by setting up a given boundary condition or a given context, that they will all agree on the result because they are effectively having the same interaction. And if they were agents, uh, the same experience uh, of the interaction. Uh, so I, I fail to see exactly what is the difference in uh, between the two approaches, apart from the words. I um, mean, the words and matter. I, I agree, they matter. I, I agree. They, but they I, matter. Uh, I mean, that, tell that, me that's the only thing that if you <laughs> tell me that's the only difference, then I agree. Then I, um, I have no confusion. Okay, so let, let's try to go beyond words. So, no, I think it's it's essentially a big word difference. It's the and also what I really insisted on is the fact that um, in CSM, we don't, we don't uh, have this distinction between absolute facts and relative facts. There are only facts, the only um, uh, sentence that, that is eligible as a fact is what Carlo would call an absolute fact. Well, a context dependent fact uh, the, is what they will call a relative fact. And, uh, and uh, it's no, absolute in your term, in, in no. your, uh, it's objective. So say, say it again, sorry. In your terminology. I'm, I'm the day after the, the second job and I'm, I'm like uh, blinking, so <laughs> you need to um, uh, say it again, sorry, uh, Daniele, please. It seems to me that uh, what you call an objective context-dependent fact 
uh, is what they would call a relative fact. No, uh, so uh, it's what Carlo would call an absolute fact. I don't think so, because specifying a context uh, is exactly like specifying an observer in relation to quantum mechanics. And it would be the same in other uh, neo Copenhagen uh, interpretations if you do not draw a further difference between observers and agents, uh, uh, which then reflects in what type of probability, in what, you, what is the nature of probabilities in your, in your interpretation. But otherwise, uh, I would. It's just that, uh, so in what I know from RQM, and uh, I was not aware of the distinction between agent and observer, which is a point I, I, I noted from, from my record, um, we don't allow any type of correlation to give rise to something that uh, is eligible as a fact. Uh, there, is, um, there must be a context to define a fact, while in RQM, uh, systems can be equivalent and we can consider uh, facts that are relative to any kind of interaction between any kind of system. So that's where the demarcation line takes place. We will just consider to define facts and properties uh, interaction between systems and context, where context allow us to uh, um, ground objectivity, legally ground objectivity, because everyone will agree on what happens inside the context. So that's where the difference uh, takes place. I don't know if it's clear what I said. I don't see you nodding, so I'm a bit worried. Uh, but... uh, no, I, I hope it's clear in the sense that I'm trying to, to check with myself if I understood. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, I don't want to take too much time. The other yeah, I'm sorry. I'm very sorry to interrupt you, but maybe we can come back to this. And I saw that Carlo maybe had a, uh, was about to say something. In which case, please. No, no, I'll come. I'll come back later. Maybe. So, Alexa, you, you said absolute. You meant stable facts when you said absolute fact, probably. Yeah, yeah, absolutely stable facts. Yeah. Okay. So next one is uh, Richard Haley. Healy. Thank you. Um, I have two very brief remarks. Uh, first remark, um, I thoroughly agree with you that the notion of an objective fact is very important and scientists are going to shoot themselves in the foot if they reject this notion. Um, second brief point, I think you should call your object-based ontology a property-based ontology because even relational quantum mechanics are countenance as the existence of objects. Um, the objects are the observers. Any physical object counts as an observer, so they have to be objects. And indeed, any relational view has to ask themselves what the relations relate, and the answer is going to be objects. Um, uh, now, a more substantive issue uh, concerns the contexts. Um, I think that your kind of objectivity uh, which is very important um, depends on the notion of a universal context. Um, but how does the context become universal and how do we define context in the first place? Here I suggest you should really appeal to the notion of decoherence um, and you should note the fact that um, decoherence being so um, extraordinarily quick and efficient uh, renders us all uh, very quickly in the same context. So that's how you get your universal context out of a, a, a generic um, understanding of what a context is. Uh, and then noting important facts about uh, decoherence, or at least uh, facts about the way we model uh, decoherence. Um, so I, I, that's a, a, a kind of constructive suggestion as to how to improve on the notion of a context by appeal to decoherence, and to use it to make sense of the idea of a universal context, which I think is crucial to you in answering Daniele's uh, worries. Yeah, so... Uh... CSM was not the big star today, so uh, actually the universal context I would have been about to tell about you if I had had 50, 50, uh, more, 15 more minutes. Um, because uh, to, to explain where does the quantum character uh, come from and the fact that uh, in the quantum world we cannot concatenate as many contexts as we want, uh, while in the classical, there is no upper bound to the number of contexts we can uh, put together to extract some information on the system. 
So uh, this is something that um, we thought about. And uh, regarding decoherence, this is also something we thought about. The only thing that I want to, to, to add uh, is that decoherence um, actually puts together a system and in principle, two contexts in the sense that uh, if there is no decoherence, then uh, we keep certain results in a, given, in a given context, but then decoherence is somehow a measurement that is performed by another context, which is not compatible. And um, to us, we, we, we try to establish an ontology where we didn't have to grasp to two contexts uh, to, to, to have meaningful uh, context, uh, concept, sorry. So in our opinion, and our by our, I, I mean uh, Philippe and Naila uh, as well, um, this is a bit of an um, escape to try to ground the, the, the ontology uh, in the decoherence. Uh, we should be able to define stuff in the most simple possible situation, which is a simple uh, a context and a system, but a single context and a single system, not a system and two contexts. That's why we are fighting a bit because uh, decoherence at the end of the day, it eliminates all the problem because it eliminates the quantum character of probabilities. And at the end of the day, there is nothing more to say. So that's, um, but we can discuss more. Uh, I know uh, Carlo talks a lot also about decoherence uh, uh, to justify for some of the wording. Uh, Richard, I don't hear you anymore. Sorry. Richard is... is uh, uh, Richard, you're mute. He's mute. He's I need mute. to read more of your work to get a handle on what you mean by a universal context. Yeah, with pleasure. <laughs> okay, so next one is uh, Ippo. Uh, yeah, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm going to be quick because what I was uh, going to ask you was already discussed by, by Daniela. Is, it was about the, the sentence facts are relative. I'm not sure that Carlo's interpretation can just be reduced to that. Uh, I get, uh, that was my opinion, not point. Not... Sorry, I can't let you say that. I extracted some con. Um, yeah, you're extracting some con. Yeah. No, 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 no. I, I agree with you, but in my, in my opinion, it was more. The, the one of the conclusion that you can extract from that is rather than facts are relative it will be like objective facts or perspective or something like this and i think that you also have the same thing in csm i, I i'm not sure that there is some contradiction with csm now i agree with you that maybe the semantics is different maybe we should be careful about the semantics mm -hmm. but yes. Uh, yes to me the the um, what's lurking inside is is the same the to me the big difference between csm and, and carlos interpretation was more about the definition of a context or or the reference and uh yeah, that's because in CSM, in csm in carlos it's completely universal but in csm you 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 base your notion of context on some empirical evidence and to me this is this was the big the big difference between your two interpretations not the fact that facts are relative because so i agree with you that maybe it's uh, the wording is not uh, could be refined, but I could I could say uh, I could extract from CSM in if I'm the developed advocate to say okay is they also saying fact is is uh, relative to a certain context, but I could also say the same for for your interpretation. But you probably maybe you disagree. I don't know. But <laughs> well, where where I, I something that you said maybe like. Uh, it's we define the context with empirical evidence, which is uh, not the point. We, we define the context as the place where uh, objective facts show up, which is not about an experiment or whatever. It's a deeper definition. Again, it's not a lab ontology. So, and for the rest, uh, I, I try to um, differentiate CSM from RQM, where it had to be, and, uh, and show the common points as well. And there are a lot, actually, it's been a year that uh, we see that there are a lot of common points, but there are also points where we are, yeah, yeah. We are not the same. So, no, no, I agree uh, with that. But yeah, maybe we, should, we can discuss uh, later on the, on the notion of context in CSM. Yes. Like, yes. Uh, Thank you. So, of course, we're running out 
uh, we're running late, so I ask you to be as quick as possible. We have three questions. The first one is from Peter. It's actually a, a remark. If Peter wants to make it loud, uh, I'll I'll turn it into a question. Um, thank you, Alexia. That was um, a lovely talk. I enjoyed it. My comment was actually along the lines of what Daniela and uh, Richard were saying, so I'll, I'll keep this very short. But just to be brief about it, I think any physical system can define a context. I don't, um, and, no. and, and, and when it does so, when it does so, it's, um, uh, it can define objectivity as well. I think any physical system can define a context in which ob objectivity can be maintained from that perspective. Uh, I see you're shaking your head, you disagree. <laughs> yeah, because uh, I mean, uh, look at the last experiment on a Wigner friend where we measure with photons and then we have uh, facts that contradict, contradict each other. Clearly, single photons are not contexts because they don't bring the objectivity and the fact that once the measurement is done, every other agent or any other observer will agree. Uh, that's all the points of these Wigner's friends uh, stories. The fact that the measurement is done, uh, uh, I mean, we observe a correlation between two systems and then we change basis. We get a correlation for two um, in another basis. So we observe another fact. And the fact that we observe at the end of the day, they are not compatible. So that's precisely against this kind of uh, overselling uh, that we fight. But again, it's a wording problem here. Uh, it's uh, um, so not everything is a context to, to conclude. Uh, a context is what typically brings you this stable, repeatable character that we need to, uh, to define objectivity. Yeah, I, I take your point, but I, I, I respectfully disagree. I think that, um, that it doesn't matter that contexts aren't compatible. I think it's fine for contexts to not be compatible, but maybe we can discuss it another time. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And Anok, thank you for the for, for betraying the question. That's nice of you. I was thinking exactly the same. Uh, we missed the last break, so I suggest we do take a break now. Uh, three minutes, no more than that. And I'm sorry with Valentin and uh, Anok, of course, you're going to be the first on the list uh, right after Carlos reply, along with the people that wanted to ask a question uh, in the last talk. So yeah, let, let's have a bre break in, and reconvene in three, four minutes uh, for the next talk. Alexia, thank you again for the talk. Thanks.
uh, Matteo. Yeah. Uh, do you want to start sharing? Uh, actually, Mauro should do it because okay. we have slightly different presentations. Okay. Yes, we decided to split the presentation into parts. So you're going to disagree among each other? Obviously. Well, <laughs> yes, the second part we completely you uh, completely the first. You couldn't agree on a presentation. <laughs> uh, ciao, Carlo. Ciao, Mauro. So uh, tell me when.